Thank you. It really is lovely to be here. I haven't been at this podium since I gave my inaugural lecture many, many years ago. Um, I came to Sussex in 1989. Uh, those were different times. Um, I knew the founding historians, probably perhaps better than many people around here. Who could remember on your very first day of being at Sussex, having a pastoral visit from Keith Middlemass, uh, who used to take me to what was then the common room and tell me that my generation was totally benighted and would never be able to afford property. <laughs> one could continue to do that again. Um, there were many. I was, uh, Willie Lamont uh, appointed me and for years lived under the miscon two misconceptions. One, that I supported Arsenal. I do now say so he was right. <laughs> and the other, that I was under 30. Uh, and he used to tell people this for many, many years after I was well into my 30s. And uh, Rod Kedwood, uh, an inspiring figure, Rod and Carol who uh, lent us Moses basket for our first baby. Beryl who always used to remind us not just about the Terrapins but also that the one things the Russians like are strong leaders and she's proved to be correct as well. And I'm one could go on but this is not an exercise in nostalgia. It was certainly a very good time to be, had many, many good years at Sussex, and Sussex shaped me perhaps, I'm sure, more than any other institution other than perhaps the University of Cape Town. And then towards the end of my time, one has to say things, uh, things, things were rather rougher, and what was known as Old Sussex was seen as, uh, as tainted. And I think it was at that point uh, that Beryl in particular, but other of the founding generation of historians, really came through, and it wasn't just the support of a lecture like this, it was really to give some kind of institutional stability, uh, to remind us of the importance of history, and I think that was extraordinarily important um, at a time when many of us were beginning to feel more like founding than founding historians. One thing I always stressed in my teaching here was to break the artificial division between European and global history. We didn't use the term at the time. It was, you know, extra European history, not a very nice uh, phrase. But anyway, and to make the point that Britain was part of Europe uh, and part of the world. And my interest in the Commonwealth has partly come out of that, and thus this is the topic today. I'm going to be speaking about a long sweep of history, um, and it's an attempt as well, in particular, to note, to invert the customary point of reference. That is, to see the Commonwealth not as it has been seen by many, many historians from the center, but rather to look at it from the outside in, from the periphery. And here I want to make the claim that South Africa has a special place in the Commonwealth, and that its place there has been framed by two of its leading 20th century statesmen, Jan Smuts and Nelson Mandela, both of whom actually have statues in Parliament Square, I think the only country outside of Britain to have two representatives in Parliament Square, which is a little bit better perhaps than being on a park bench in Grosvenor Square, as we heard in the wonderful lecture that uh, Clive Webb gave us last week. And my secondary argument is that South Africa uniquely was the issue which gave birth to the Commonwealth idea. In the mid-20th century, as the Commonwealth sought to transform itself into a post-imperial and non-aligned organization, the problem of race and apartheid featured as a central concern. But even after South Africa's departure from the Commonwealth in 1961, apartheid South Africa's absent presence and its significance as the global exemplar of institutionalized racism helped to bind the Commonwealth as a multiracial organization with strongly defined ethical values. South Africa's reintegration to the Commonwealth in 1994 was widely welcomed as a triumph for the Commonwealth, but paradoxically it proved to be something of a pyrrhic victory, and it may actually have contributed to the Commonwealth's current state of malaise. Any attempt to renew interest in the Commonwealth idea has to first take account of the fact that it's an unfashionable academic topic, and that it has been for some time. Whereas imperial history is widely considered to have enjoyed a revival since the 1980s, the history of the Commonwealth, viewed as a political institution, as a set of concepts, and in some cases as an article of faith, has experienced stagnation. 
A great deal of the output that appears under the rubric of Commonwealth history might just as easily fall under the more capacious er umbrella of area studies, but quite why the Commonwealth has become so unfashionable is a subject, as a subject for historians, merits consideration. Its waning salience in international affairs is one obvious reason, but needless to say, history is not always about success stories. But perhaps the Commonwealth has fallen into neglect because historians of ideas are often not very interested in institutions, just as in historians of institutions are often apt to ignore ideas. The dearth of interest in the Commonwealth appears all the more striking, however, when compared with institutions like the United Nations and the League of Nations. These bodies are now attracting lively new scholarship. In the case of the League, the dream of internationalism and peace has been analyzed afresh by writers like Manella, Helen McCarthy, and Patricia McLavin. Patricia McLavin. And uh, there's another parallel lot of work being done, very interesting work on uh, humanitarianism and internationalism. But as if to underline the point about the loss of interest in the Commonwealth as an organization, the conspicuous absence of any attention to the Commonwealth in Susan Pedersen's major new recent book, The Guardian as the League of Nations and the Crisis of Empire, is to me striking. By contrast, the circumstances leading to the creation of the United Nations is now attracting a great deal of attention, sparked in no small measure by the attention paid to it by Mark Mazar, also a Sussex graduate. Not graduate, but uh, lecturer. Much the same can be said about, and yet one of Mark Mazar's points is that the League, uh, for all its weaknesses, was an extraordinary diplomatic innovation, a realization of the dreams of many 19th century internationalists and a moment of truth for others. And I think much the same can be said for the Commonwealth, which was similarly floated on ideas of international governance, world federation, and transnational constitutionalism. In the first half of the 20th century, the Commonwealth was preoccupied with the specific challenges of the management of empire in war and in peace. After 1945, it sought to cope with the challenges of decolonization, multiracialism, and new forms of international alliance in the context of the Cold War and its aftermath. Perhaps the most remarkable feature of the Commonwealth is its adaptation and survival. Uniquely, it's the only body of its type which has no clear founding date, and its slow demise suggests that it may not have a clear point of termination either. It's striking how many key figures in the concept in the conception of the Commonwealth went on to apply their insights to the League and then to the United Nations. The South African statesman Jan Smuts is an outstanding example. From a different political perspective, German-born, well he wasn't in fact German-born, but German origin, uh, the British classicist and professor of international relations Alfred Zimmern stands out. Zimmern uh, coined the term the Third British Empire, which but the Commonwealth at its core marked, in his view, a significant advance on any previous empire in respect of it being a voluntary association of free and equal peoples. In turn, Zimmern saw the first British Commonwealth as a forerunner of the League and thought that it might augment in areas where the League was deficient. In old age, Zimmern hoped that the United Nations might provide the means whereby the United States could hand on the torch of freedom and secure the standing of civilization in the world, just as he had believed that Britain had done in the interwar years. With different intellectual and ideological inflections, Zimmern's liberal internationalism was echoed by Jan Smuts, and also by the imperial thinker and visionary Lionel Curtis, both of whom had a major hand in coining the term Commonwealth of Nations. The origins of the Commonwealth lie in a growing consensus shared by opinion formers in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa that local nationalisms required greater recognition within the British Empire. The point was well made by the English journalist Richard Jebb, whose influential Studies in Colonial Nationalism, published in 1905, began to reconceive the empire as a field of what he called expanding loyalties. By loyalty, Jeb meant not only devotion to Britain and the monarchy, but also the emergence of what he called colonial self-respect. Jeb's view concluded that the empire could only be sustained by working in association with local nationalisms. To resist such forces was futile. 
His ideas accorded well with new feelings of colonial pride in the Dominions. Keith Hancock spoke at the time, or a little later, of the emergence of independent Australian Britons. Keith Sinclair used similar terms to characterize those who came to think of themselves as New Zealanders and Britons. And Carl Berger, writing about Canada, argued that Canadian imperialism could be understood as one variety of Canadian nationalism. Now, if the key impetus for the development of the idea of Commonwealth derived from growing feelings of colonial nationalism in the Dominions, it was in South Africa that these forces converged in a state of molten white heat. For Australians, Canadians, and New Zealanders, participation in the Boer War proved a testing ground for their respective sense of nationhood. In South Africa, white political nationhood emerged as the overriding political problem in the uneasy peace that followed. Efforts to reconcile Boer republicanism with British imperialism gave rise to the Closer Union movement. And this culminated rather unexpectedly in the creation of the first new South Africa in 1910, which immediately came to be regarded as an exemplary model of successful conflict resolution. The Milner Kindergarten, the term given to the group of young Oxford graduates who coalesced in South Africa, played a decisive role in this process. Their initial brief was to secure Milner's pre-war view of South Africa as a self-governing white community situated firmly within the British Empire. But they soon came to understand that this objective could no longer be achieved as their hero imagined. In order to understand this, uh, we have to look to a series of letters, including a letter to Smuts from the Cape Liberal statesman John X. Merriman, where he opposed Milner's wrong-headed efforts to achieve federation by building a house from the roof downwards, referencing the Grand Academy of Legado in Gulliver's Travels. Instead, Merriman looked forward to the creation of a British Commonwealth of which South Africa, as well as Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, will form an integral part with all the rights of a free, self-governing community. In 1906, the kindergarten had come to acknowledge the importance of what they called the South African view. They now accepted, out of a combination of strategic political calculation and genuine conviction, that closer union could only be achieved by working together with the forces of Afrikaner nationalism. Their pragmatism and instrumentalism was legitimized by a sense of moral purpose and higher unity. This outlook was shared through a sense of Milner's belief in the state as a creative force of good, and it was infused by a variety of other influences, amongst them neo-Hegelian idealism, new liberalism, Christian socialism, and supranational Anglo-Saxonism. Drawing them together was the assumption that, Brit that the British was were possessed of a unique talent, perhaps underpinned by providential duty for imperial governance. Having achieved union in 1910, Smuts himself began to think in much larger terms, and so too did key members of the kindergarten, who in 1909 formed a new organization known as the Round Table. This was a tightly organized and well-dispersed think tank which was designed to influence elite British politics. Lionel Curtis, one of the leading figures in the transition from kindergarten to round table, now devoted his considerable energies to the idea of bringing about imperial federation. There were several versions of the concept of imperial federation. Some approached full integration with the United Kingdom on the lines of the Act of Union, 1707. Others tended towards autonomous local legislatures with direct representation in the House of Commons and the Lords. Joseph Chamberlain was a noted believer in the virtues of one supreme and imperial parliament. But the full-blown idea of a supreme federal entity with strong central controls was decisively defeated at the 1917 Imperial War Conference 100 years ago in large measure as a result of the decisive intervention of Jan Smuts. Associates from the South African kindergarten grouping led discussions on how to recognize the empire now as a loosely defined organic union, a key term that figures in roundtable thinking for the first 30 years of its existence. Curtis and his associates in the round table built upon well-established Victorian impulses towards imperial federation in pursuit of Greater Britain, which might also be applicable to the home nations, Ireland in particular. They in turn were particularly inspired 
by F.S. Oliver's 1906 biography of Alexander Hamilton, the American proponent of federalism. Curtis's development of the federalist idea is still, was, is still, I think, an overlooked strand of British political thought in the Victorian and Edwardian periods. In 1915, uh, Curtis published a lengthy book entitled The Project of a Commonwealth, followed by a more digestible version as The Problem of the, uh, a Year Later. Collectively written as was now by established practice with kindergarten roundtable productions, the enterprise amounted to an extended historicist exercise around the theme of empire and the need for imperial federation. The most profound insight in Deborah Lavin's estimation was recognition of the dominion perspective, the idea that Britain is not the Commonwealth, but merely a part of it. As well as the vexed issue of taxation, one of the key issues that continued to divide the round table was whether India should enjoy representation of the Commonwealth. And here, of course, the question bore, this question bore heavily on views of race, as well as calculations as to whether the Commonwealth would be institutionally stronger with India in or out. The origins of the word Commonwealth also have a direct South African association, and here again a key intervention comes from Smuts, who started using the word in private uh, from around 1902 when calling for a stable Commonwealth in South Africa in which Boer and Britain will be proud to be partners. Smuts made this conception of Commonwealth his own in a resolution drafted at the 1917 Imperial War Conference in London. And here he elaborated his view in a speech to both houses of the British Parliament in May, where he spoke of the Commonwealth as a dynamic, evolving system of states and communities under a common flag. The significance of this intervention was that it scotched the more centralist drive to imperial federation prompted by the Round Table. And it was on this account that Smuts was, Smuts was congratulated for putting the lid on Messrs. Lionel Curtis and Company. But close attention to nuance is required when reading the texts of this period. While Smuts and Curtis both spoke of the Commonwealth as a form of organic union, the metaphor with its biological and evolutionist overtones implied two very different structural arrangements. For Curtis, an organic Commonwealth was a means to preserve British influence and might imply a federal superstate with an imperial parliament. By contrast, for Smuts and other Dominion leaders, like Canadian Robert Borden, Maintenance of local sovereignties was crucial. Borden also supported Smuts in seeing the Commonwealth as a community or League of Nations, which might serve as an exemplar to that worldwide League of Nations. The view of the Dominions as autonomous nations within an imperial Commonwealth was sealed by the 1921 Anglo-Irish Treaty. But further efforts to clarify the arcane nature of dominionhood continued to absorb the energies of legal draftsmen, politicians, and masters of protocol. Pressure to, exerted by the premiers of South Africa and Canada, Herzog and Mackenzie King, proved a significant influence on the 1926 Balfour Declaration. And this precept defined Britain and the dominions as autonomous communities within the British Empire, equal in status, in no way subordinate one to another in any aspect of their domestic or external affairs. In ordinary parlance, there was rather less precision concerning the question as to whether the Commonwealth was coterminous with empire. What precisely was meant by the term British? During the Second World War, there was somewhat of a reversion to earlier usage as Churchill deliberately conflated the terms British, Empire, and Commonwealth. The American government deliberately used the phrase British Commonwealth of Nations during the war and continued to do so even after. But the sense of custodial ownership was already anachronistic and the advent of new member states after 1947 eventuated in the dropping of the adjective British, whether treated as a claim to ownership or merely as a historical description. By the time of the 1948 meeting of Commonwealth Prime Ministers in London, this semantic process was neatly, nearly formalized, occasioning sharp debate in Britain and also in the Dominions. In a note on Commonwealth nomenclature, Clement Attlee denied in 1948 that there was any deliberate policy to omit the word British before Commonwealth, but he nevertheless advised use of the shorter title, the Commonwealth of Nations, everywhere other than informal communications with foreign powers. The new era for the Commonwealth begins in about 1947, when newly decolonized countries, India, Sri Lanka, and Malaya, 
join the organization. This incremental process of absorption and multicultural experimentation continued until 1961, the year of South Africa's departure. From a small, tightly knit group of white dominions whose prime ministers viewed annual Commonwealth meetings in London as an opportunity for close networking and policy making, the organization grew to become an expanding association of states with inchoate, not to say conflicting interests. Attlee, who looked, cl looked to closer integration with the old dominions and empire with a view to reviving the broken post-war British economy and maintaining its defense capabilities, assured the Commons in 1948 that Britain was not solely a European power, but was a member of a great Commonwealth and empire. It's taken me this long, and I haven't yet mentioned Brexit. <laughs> By contrast, India decided to remain uh, India, it's, uh, sorry, the Irish Free State, of course, this is very problematic because the, uh, it was on ostensibly the right to neutrality, that is to say, resisting Attlee's attempt to maintain the Commonwealth as a security arrangement, which precipitated the decision by the Irish Free State to leave the Commonwealth in 1949 and to declare itself as a republic. By contrast, India decided to remain within the Commonwealth, and quite why it did so is more of a puzzle than many accounts allow. The temptation amongst Commonwealth chroniclers is to present the emergence of the new multiracial Commonwealth as a preordained constitutional procession, a post-dated Whiggish version of an older empire decolonization story. In 1948, Nehru agreed that India should remain part of the Commonwealth so long as India's full sovereignty could be assured, but he had doubts that the Indian public would agree to remain in the Commonwealth in face of Britain's failure to treat India fairly or squarely on other matters. Nehru's reasons for sticking with the Commonwealth appear to have less to do with sentimental attachment, not, none, notwithstanding his affinities with Englishness, than pragmatic reasoning. For one thing, Nehru was aware that Pakistan would remain within the Commonwealth, and he feared that Jinnah might tease India out of that association. Anti-Soviet sentiment was another factor disposing him to stay put. And so instead, Nehru sought to refashion the Commonwealth as a post-colonial institution. Key members of the British government, aptly included, appear to have misread Nehru's intentions out of a mixture of pious hopes and fears about the consequences of Indian exit. Diplomatic niceties, pallid optimism, and accommodating habits have tended to play down the extent to which the inauguration of a multiracial Commonwealth marked a departure from existing arrangements between Britain and the White Dominions. No longer did meetings of Commonwealth Prime Ministers have the atmosphere of a cabinet meeting where there was free and formal exchange of views. India's accession to the Commonwealth was deeply troubling to Smuts because it broke up a meaningful political association into which he had put so much energy and faith. But Smuts in 1948 was no longer in power, having just been voted out as South African Prime Minister. He chose to articulate his fears in terms of regret that the conception of a symbolic crown as head of the Commonwealth now amounted to a constitutional fiction, entirely lacking in substance. By contrast, and hugely surprisingly, the new Prime Minister, Partey Prime Minister Daniel Malan, proved amenable to India's remaining in the Commonwealth. Malan pointed out that India was anti-communist, or at least anti-Soviet, Moreover, India offered a precedent for continuing Commonwealth membership as a fully sovereign republic. While in opposition serving as leader of the Afrikaner nationalist movement, Malan had supported demands to break the British connection, and he was also strongly anti-Asian. But in government, he proved reluctant to sever links with the outside world. And in a striking reversal from the government's wholesale opposition to British imperialism and, and its insistence on neutrality in the fight against fascism, Smuts, Milan, sorry, chose to see Commonwealth membership as a bulwark against diplomatic isolation, and in, do so, in doing so, he shocked many of his supporters. And so there is, to me, a delicious irony in the differing approaches taken by Smuts and Milan. The former, more liberal and far more worldly, held on to the old conception of a white man's world in which the Commonwealth retained direct affiliations to the monarchy. This was fully demonstrated in 1947, when Smuts invested so much personal energy in playing host to the royal family's tour of South Africa. By contrast, the insular and dogged, but not altogether doctrinaire Milan, was newly in charge of a triumphant Afrikaner nationalist movement, 
that had barely acknowledged the presence of the royal family in South Africa and which routinely vilified Smuts as the handyman of empire. But rather than resisting Indian membership, Milan actively encouraged it. And when he came to London in 1949 for the crucial meeting of the Commonwealth ministers, he and his wife charmed London's diplomatic circles. The alliance of convenience between Nehru and Milan was entirely unlikely, but it is explicable, I think, if one accepts that neither of them thought of the Commonwealth as an institution whose spiritual bond was validated through allegiance to the monarch. Both now viewed Commonwealth membership in pragmatic and strategic terms. When India became a republic, Nehru is said to have treasured Milan's note of congratulations more than any other message from abroad. Now, the story changes from 1949 very dramatically with new Commonwealth entrants like India and Ghana uh, very strongly opposed to apartheid. But it's not been always noted as carefully as it should, that actually India and Ghana were much less inclined to make an issue of South Africa's racial policies at heads of Commonwealth government meetings than they were in other fora like the United Nations. Nor did South Africa want to rock the Commonwealth boat. Continuing membership soothed Africana as well as English-speaking fears of international isolation. Unlike the United Nations, from which South Africa briefly withdrew in 1956 in protest of being targeted for criticism, the Commonwealth thus remained a relatively protected space from which the South African government was able to observe and participate in international affairs. A call by Tom Dryberg uh, to commit a future Labour government in Britain to work towards South Africa's expulsion from the Commonwealth was rejected by the Labour Party in 1956. And the ruling Conservative Party was determined to keep South Africa within the fold. Macmillan was acutely aware of the very powerful economic factors linking South Africa and Britain in his dealings with Favut. One key message of his famous 1960 Wind of Change speech was that South Africa could no longer depend on Britain's veto at the United Nations. But another was that Favut remained welcome in the Commonwealth. The challenge for the unity of the expanded Commonwealth was that as long as, as long-term strategic and economic networks of interests were degraded, so residual sentimental ties of attachment became... What have I done? No. No. So as long as, these resi as, as the Commonwealth is declining as a military and strategic alliance, so sentimental ties of attachment become commensurately much more important in tying the organization together. As Britain and its ex-dependent colonies adjusted to a new kind of mutuality in the 1950s, the Commonwealth was increasingly projected as an agency for development and progress, or more neutrally as an intermediary between divided regions of the world. Conspicuous efforts were made to present the Commonwealth as a third force, capable of transcending the Cold War divide. In the words of Nicholas Mansour, there was a time of hope when the launching of the experiment in multiracial membership from around 1947, when it was thought that the world might learn even more. Commonwealth statesmen at the time delighted to extol this great experiment in cooperation between peoples and nations from every continent. To speak of the Commonwealth as a bridge between East and West, between developed and underdeveloped nations, between European, Asian and African, to emphasize its unique character and to think of it as a model of what the whole world might one day become. Patrick Gordon Walker, sounded similar notes of optimism as he expounded on the new Commonwealth's role as a free association of democracies rooted in a common, constantly evolving history and based on morality in international affairs. South Africa's exit, he predicted, would undoubtedly strengthen the Commonwealth as a force for race equality throughout the world. But these hopeful sentiments relied on a strong element of wishful thinking and they simply were not able to stand up to the gathering impatience of African countries and post-colonial critiques of race and empire. Nor in the case of Gordon Walker's political career could they withstand growing racist reaction within Britain. In 1964, Gordon Walker was defeated in his parliamentary seat of Smethwick as a result of his opposition to the Conservative Commonwealth Immigration Act. Racism was conspicuously to the, f to the fore in the Smethwick campaign. And at the BBC, a senior programmer noted at the time that the Commonwealth hardly evokes popular passion in this country, except in a form very near the knuckle, 
coloured immigration. Liberal internationalists continued to propagate the virtues and possibilities of the Commonwealth as a beneficial force for good or soft power in today's Parliament. But conversely, conservatives and the old Tory elite felt the loss of British primacy very keenly, and they often resented the ways in which the new Commonwealth members were using its institutions to attack Britain itself. The fug of imperial nostalgia began to be oxygenated by fresh drafts of post-colonial air in organizations like the Royal Commonwealth Society and the Commonwealth Institute, both of which dropped the terms empire from their names in 1958. Meanwhile, ordinary white Britons were enjoined to identify the Commonwealth with immigration and multiculturalism. And in doing so, evoked a latent set of anxieties that was given sharp focus by the aggressive campaigning of Enoch Powell. And this, of course, reached high point of intensity in his rivers of blood speech. Powell was inclined to a clean break with empire, including the Commonwealth, which he, produced, which he pronounced to be a farce in 1964. Things change again very strongly in 1960, the year of the Sharpeville Massacre in South Africa. Notably, Macmillan, who had just been a few months before uh, delivering his Wind of Change speech in Cape Town, did not take any comfort from the view that in respect of apartheid, his speech was a prophecy fulfilled. Revulsion towards South African apartheid policies as a result of the Sharpeville and Lunga events was immediately felt at the United Nations and around the, around the world. But within the Commonwealth itself, the reverberations were initially muted. Sometimes overlooked in the sequence of events, but crucial for the Commonwealth connection, was for Wood's controversial government announced just before Sharpeville to hold a referendum on the country becoming a republic. By no means all Afrikaners were persuaded that abandoning South Africa's links to the British monarchy was either wise or welcome, and Favut himself gave every indication that he didn't wish to withdraw from the Commonwealth. For one thing, Britain was still South Africa's most important trading partner and remained its major source of overseas investment. And so the widespread assumption that South Africa was expelled from the Commonwealth in 1961 is inaccurate. Technically, Favut withdrew his application to rejoin as a republic in the face of strong anti-apartheid pressure. But in the lead up to the Commonwealth Conference, Macmillan and its Secretary for State for Commonwealth Relations, Duncan Sands, used every possible tactical device to avoid a dust-up over South Africa. Disarmament was meant to be the theme of the conference. Nkrumah of Ghana said that he would raise the question of South Africa's membership if no one else did but he added that he had no desire for a showdown. And the issue of South Africa's membership only came to the fore after Julius Nyerere published a letter in The Observer stating that Tanganyika, Tanzania, would stay out of the Commonwealth if South Africa failed to make changes to its racial policies. The point of no return in 1961 was reached as a result of Favut's unwillingness to countenance a group statement identifying apartheid as inconsistent with the basic ideals on which the unity and influence of the Commonwealth rest, coupled with his stubborn refusal to accept even the theoretical possibility of black Commonwealth diplomats being resident in Pretoria. To the very last, Macmillan, with the support of Menzies in Australia, did everything possible to avert South Africa's exit, seeking desperately to find a formula. And Macmillan's failure to achieve this represented a grievous political defeat for him. South Africa's withdrawal from the Commonwealth meant that the organization was now entering new territory as a proponent of multi-racism and as a guarantee of rights and freedoms. But this was very uncertain terrain. The Commonwealth did not take the opportunity to endorse Diffenbaker of Canada's Declaration of Racial Equality in 1961 which Favut had found so unacceptable. At this time, as Peter Lyon has pointed out, the Commonwealth was still basically a British-run club of former dominions and dependencies comprising up to a dozen members. Its meetings were always held in London and chaired by the British Prime Minister in Downing Street. There were few press briefings and decisions were communicated by Tess Communique. But by the 1960s, Britain had begun to adopt a lower profile in the Commonwealth, and a new Commonwealth Secretariat took over the major functions of the organization in 1965. In 1968, the British Foreign Office absorbed the Commonwealth Relations Office, in so doing downgrading the latter's separate importance. 
and the Commonwealth Secretariat's use of Marlborough House from 1965 maintained a sense of decorative connection with monarchy and tradition, but it also signaled a functional displacement from British power centres in Downing Street and Whitehall. Through the 1960s, the closely related issues of white minority rule in Rhodesia and South Africa increasingly took centre stage, with Rhodesia figuring most prominently in the middle of the decade. But it proved easier for the Commonwealth to project these, its new values externally than to apply them to their own states. Ian Smith's U declaration of UDI in 1965 set many Commonwealth members against Britain on account of Britain's intimate connections to the rogue state, much as the British government resistance to sanctions did in the case of South Africa in the 1980s. And it's not difficult to read into the Commonwealth's hostility to South Africa and Rhodesia a delayed reaction by post-colonial states against the old imperial metropole, not least because Britain remained the principal constraint on, impu on imposing punitive sanctions on white minority governments in both those countries. Arms sales to South Africa became a highly contentious issue as the 1971 meeting of Commonwealth heads of government in Singapore. The acrimony expressed towards the British government was because the, the British government insisted on the importance of the continuing use of the Simonstown naval base as part of its defense of the Indian and South Atlantic Oceans. And this led the Foreign Office to conclude that the issue of South Africa came very close to wrecking the Commonwealth. But on another reading, the tensions at this time actually helped to, com to keep the Commonwealth intact by reinvigorating it with a sense of moral purpose. The Singapore meeting is now mostly remembered for passing a declaration of principles, and important amongst these was to assist in the elimination of discrimination based on differences of race, color, and creed. Krishnan Srinivasan has characterized the era from Singapore 1971 to Harare 1991, those 20 years, as an era in which principles and values were affirmed and refined, none more so than those of racial equality, where apartheid South Africa stood out as anathema. Key ethical statements included the 1977 Glen Eagles Agreement, which was designed to exclude South Africa from international sport, and the 1979 Lusaka Declaration on Racism and Racial Prejudice. From 1987, Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Committee on Southern Africa played a significant role. But the inconsistency and fragility of an ethical approach was highlighted by the Commonwealth's inability to act decisively or with anything like approaching unanimity on matters like the violation of human rights in Uganda or the growth of one-party systems amongst its own members. The 1979 meeting in Lusaka was also controversial because of the presence of the Queen. Her personal commitment to the Commonwealth was appreciated, but her ambiguous constitutional role as head of the Commonwealth raised serious questions in Britain and also for members of the Commonwealth like Sonny Rampal. In the end, she was welcome because even less welcome was Margaret Thatcher and the Tory rights support for Ian Smith's Rhodesia. Coming at a critical juncture in the bloody transition to majority rule in Rhodesia and with guerrilla armies launching incursions from Zambia and Mozambique, Margaret Thatcher's attendance at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Lusaka was deeply divisive, and the arrival at the airport, she put on dark glasses for fear that acid may be thrown in her eyes. Derek Ingram observed that the 1980 Rhodesian political settlement, and after, that after this apartheid South Africa dominated Commonwealth discussions for the rest of the decade. For Sonny Rumfell, apartheid was not just the South African problem, it was the Rhodesia problem. It's the African problem they make inevitable and the world racial problem they exacerbate. But most of all, he said, for the West, it's a national problem, a domestic problem, a personal problem, a problem of the quality of Western principles and Western values. Rumpel's decision or desire to universalize the problem of apartheid marked a step change from earlier attempts to confine the problem to matters <laughs> of local jurisdiction. To be anti-apartheid was henceforth increasingly central to the Commonwealth's self-image and sense of legitimacy. From the point of the Commonwealth, anti-apartheid activism reached a peak at its highly publicized meeting in the Bahamas in 1985, when Mrs. Thatcher found herself in a minority of one in her efforts to prevent a resolution against the imposition of sanctions. Mrs. Thatcher boasted to the television cameras that she had conceded only a tiny bit. 
But for Rumfall, an unprecedented degree of moral unity was being achieved in adversity. The key gain was Thatcher's agreement to support a, com a, a delegation of Commonwealth eminent persons who visited South Africa in 1986 in an effort to intercede with the apartheid government. The mission in the sh was a failure in the short term. It was scuppered by the South African military's deliberately provocative raid on purported ANC bases in Zambia, Botswana, uh, and elsewhere. But the eminent person's intervention later became to be seen, at least by itself, as a crowning success. Their energetic shuttle diplomacy, crowned by a meeting with the jailed Mandela, gave impetus to what they called the negotiating concept, which five years later resulted in formal talks between the South African government and the liberation movements. The success, I think, of the, the story of the EPG has been exaggerated, but uh, for the Commonwealth, and for Ramphal in particular, it was a decisive moral and political victory. And it's indeed tempting to draw analogies between the kindergarten's role in bringing about the first new South Africa in 1910 and the Commonwealth's intervention in support of the second new South Africa 80 years later. In January 1994, Chief Anyoko, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, invited South Africa to rejoin. Queen Elizabeth had already indicated her support for South Africa's readmission. When she re invited Mandela to join the official banquet, in, 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 uh, uh, which he actually stretched protocol because South Africa was not a Commonwealth member, and of course Mandela was not yet a president. But this breach of protocol was no more serious than Mandela's addressing the Queen as Elizabeth. Mutual warmth and ample reserves of moral capital helped to smooth the process. Acting in concert, Mandela and the monarch acted, added much needed luster to the Commonwealth. Just six weeks after the election that brought the ANC to power, South Africa regained its membership of the Commonwealth and Chief Anyoko expressed his special sense of joy. Yet as Philip Murphy has pointed out, the advent of majority rule vindicated the stance that the Commonwealth had taken over many decades, but it also robbed that organization of what it had been its most prominent campaigning issue. Mandela personified the Commonwealth's professed commitment to democracy, human rights, non-racism, and the rule of law. This was an ethical arc that can be traced from Singapore in 1971 to the Harare Declaration two decades later. But the problem for the Commonwealth was contradicted by contraventions of these very principles by its own members. And these ethical lapses were no less true of post-apartheid South Africa, which has just announced its intention to draw, uh, withdraw from the International uh, Court of Human uh, ICC. In a policy framing article issued in 1993, Mandela argued powerfully that the pursuit of human rights, social equity, and democratic values would define South Africa's international foreign policy, particularly in Africa. When he attended his first heads of government summit in 1995, Mandela argued persuasively for Nigeria's suspension from the Commonwealth, just as news came in of Abacha, the Abacha regime's execution of Ken Sarawiwa and other activists. The Nigerian government suggested that white officials in Mandela's new government and in the Commonwealth had manipulated Mandela, who had imbibed Western rather than African values. Mandela's foremost domestic critic was the deputy president, Thabo Mbeki, Sussex graduate, an advocate of a softly, softly approach to Nigeria, who was apt to mock his president in private as the one good native. For a brief moment when the ANC came to power, there was a view that Mandela's moral standing might allow the country to define its foreign policy in terms of the promotion of human rights. But South Africa's foreign policy was soon reverted to a neo-realist position, which stressed pragmatism over principle and cautioned against the dangers of acting alone, especially if this meant criticizing openly the conduct of fellow African countries. Feeling exposed by its experience in attacking Abacha, the new South African democracy reverted to the unwritten law that African states do not turn against each other in international fora such as the United Nations, but close ranks when attacks are made against one or more of them. Hopes that South Africa would set new moral standards in international affairs were soon overtaken by a view that South Africa ought to behave as just another country. In 1994, the Commonwealth expert Peter Lyon 
served as part of the observer, its observers group during the country's first inclusive democratic national election. Writing anonymously in the Round Table Journal, Lyon made the point that South Africa's past, present and future are entwined in the Commonwealth. But he might well have agreed that the Commonwealth's past, present and future has also been entwined in South Africa, with one new twist. Since Mandela's time as president, South African foreign policy has displayed increasingly little interest in the Commonwealth, preferring to focus on associations like the United Nations, the BRICS, and the African Union. When the question of Zimbabwe's suspension from the Commonwealth became a divisive issue in 2002-03, Mbeki found himself in the position of siding with Mugabe, railing against imperialist and racist attitudes on the part of the white Commonwealth. This awkward experience had the effect of increasing South Africa's estrangement from the old Commonwealth, a mirror image of the racial tensions that led to South Africa's departure under Favut. Estrangement or disengagement seems also to be in line with the attitudes of many Commonwealth members who are increasingly apt to miss plenary meetings or to send low-level delegations. For all this, it's perhaps too early to write off the Commonwealth, which, as some argue, remains an important forum for small and medium-sized states. Along with its resilience and its longevity, one of the most curious aspects of the Commonwealth is its resilience. It continues to exist as much as an imagined transnational community as a practicable interstate project. Thank you. Well, it gives me a great pleasure to have the duty to thank my former colleague and friend, uh, Professor Saul Dubow. I first met Saul as a young lecturer, both of us were young, uh, in the mid-90s at the University of Sussex, when he was already making a name for himself as a historian of South Africa and as a historian of the British Empire. Today's a very fluent lecture wonderfully crafted in a soul's um, inimitable style, marries uh, these interests by argue arguing that the history of the, of the Commonwealth idea was inextricably linked to the idea of modern South Africa. In the process, he helps us to revive the historian's interest in the idea of the Commonwealth, an idea that has recently had public airing in the wake of Brexit and in, and in the wake of such headlines in the Daily De Telegraph, I note, a bright future awaits Britain post-Brexit and the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth comes to the rescue of post-Brexit Britain, old ties being revived when newer ties are being shared. Uh, Saul makes a very persuasive case for Smuts as the architect of the Commonwealth idea, whilst also arguing for the pragmatic nature of South Africa's engagement with the Commonwealth idea. India's involvement was also predicated on pragmatism. The post-colonial coming of age for the Commonwealth was achieved when a broad-based coalition emerged against the apartheid state of South Africa and a new sense of moral purpose. His focus on South Africa's role in the Commonwealth and his conclusion that the Commonwealth is defined by its relationship to South Africa is perhaps a perspective that I could uh, open up from the perspective of India. From the perspective of India, the changing Commonwealth looks like a sli slightly different animal. Nehru has been hailed as an architect who transformed the Commonwealth and even saved it. He, it was definitely his equanimity which held the Commonwealth intact, particularly in the wake of the Suez Crisis, his decision to stay, raise the Commonwealth from a mere white-dominated club to this multiracial organization. I know Saul has talked about India's role, but by focusing on South Africa, perhaps um, the picture of the changing Commonwealth and the role of India uh, I think it could be sort of teased out. 
But these are minor differences of interpretation, the stock of the historian's craft. This is an exceptional paper by an excellent historian, and I'm honored to give this vote of thanks. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you very much.